they will be in the back. Um, my husband is floating around somewhere. I'll have him wave when he comes in if I don't get back there. And they're, um, it's part of how we fund the organization, so it's a suggested donation of $10 each, but they're perfectly available, and so feel free to take advantage. In this session, we're going to talk about the testing, because Common Core rides on the tests. Remember, the states had to prove that all the kids were proficient, and the way that they prove that the children are proficient is that they pass the state assessment. So every state had to develop a state assessment, and when it moved to Common Core, the states are joining consortiums. There's two. There's the Smarter Balance, which is sort of the smaller one, and there's the PARC, the Partnership for Assessment of Readiness to College and Careers. So there were two uh, consortiums where the states could develop their own. What we're going to talk about in the testing is the construction of the test and how they were put together and how they're scored and why that doesn't work and then what happens. Federal legislation, and my husband walked in, Jim, can you like wiggle your pants? That's my husband, there you go. So you can see him at the end. Um, the CDs, there you go. <laughs> he pays such attention to me. We've been married for 35 years, you know, he doesn't listen anymore. Um, he'll tell you it's for his own protection. So, you know, we work out really well. Um, the federal legislation, No Child Left Behind, required the states to prove 100% proficiency. They had to do it through state assessments, and the federal legislation said that the assessments had to be valid and reliable. Each state, as it's implemented Common Core, also talks about they're going to use assessments, and the assessments have to be valid and reliable. If you go to the park, that partnership, the consortium website, it'll say their assessments are valid and reliable. Now, you may remember in my introduction, when I was in graduate school, part of what I had to do for my fellowship was I worked in the psychometric testing clinic. I administered tests like this, scored them, used them to diagnose children, and had to evaluate whether this test was appropriate for this child. Valid and reliable are not just words. They're actually very important. We use them to describe an evaluation mechanism that we can count on. And we use those words valid and reliable in medicine. We use them in manufacturing. And we are supposed to be using them in education. So when we look at the Common Core testing and the state tests that now are driving it, do they meet the words? Well, let's start with definition. Valid. For, a, for an assessment to be valid, that means that it tests what it says it's going to test and nothing else. That's valid. So if I said, this is a multiplication assessment and you looked at it, you would not expect to find a spelling question on that test. If this was a medical assessment about the relative weights of 100 people and you looked at what the physician was measuring, you wouldn't expect to find height on the assessment instrument. Valid. It measures what it says it's going to measure and nothing else. Part of how they do that is they eliminate what are called extraneous factors. Things that can change the result but really don't have anything to do with what I'm testing. Again, let's go to a medical model because we're really familiar with it. One of my sisters is a nurse, and for a number of years, she worked in one of the testing facilities for one of the major drug companies. So when people volunteer to allow a drug company to test a medical program or, or a pharmaceutical, there's a protocol that they go through. And you call in and you say, I'd like to volunteer. And the first thing they say is, okay, well, could you come in for a physical? And they, it's a very complete physical. They measure everything. Because if you don't meet the exact set of specifications that they're looking for, you're not accepted as a volunteer. They want everybody to be the same age, perhaps, or the same weight, perhaps, or to have the same blood pressure walking in, or the same liver function or kidney function. And if you meet the protocol, then they say, could you please come 72 hours to seven days before the test begins? Now they pay, they're paid volunteers. And the reason they pay them is they have to actually stay on site for the whole test. They have to come, depending on what they're testing, 72 hours to seven days before the test. Why? So they're pretty sure that nobody's showing up the morning of the test having been drunk the night before. Because that'll change the results. 
because then they know just what medications you are taking ahead of time, and it can take up to a week for a medication to leave your system, which is why that long, so that they know that this medication isn't interacting with the one they want to give you. And you have to stay there, so they know everybody got the same meal last night, and everybody slept the same amount of time, and nobody was in a place that was too hot or too cold. So they, as much as possible, control every factor in the life of the volunteer except for the medical program or device or drug that they're testing. They're eliminating extraneous factors so the test results can be valid. Now let's move this to education. So these kids, starting in grade three in some states, are coming in to take these state assessments, and these state assessments, we are told, are valid and reliable, and they will be used to determine promotion, and as the kids get older, graduation, and to evaluate teachers. Hmm. One of my sisters, when we were kids, she was seven, and the school we went to gave exams in January and at the end of the year. Years ago, a lot of schools did that. And when the January exams came, she flunked them all, every one. And the principal called my mom and said, Mrs. McKenna, I, I honestly don't know what happened here. She looked like she was doing fine. We, I don't know what we missed. I'm very concerned. Would you please come in and we'll talk about it? And so my mom said, yes, of course. And they made an appointment for two days after the phone call. And the next morning, my mom called the principal and said, never mind, she broke out with measles last night. So while she was taking the test, she was sick. But nobody knew it because the rash hadn't surfaced yet. And when she got over the measles, they regave her the exams, and she did just fine. Because sickness is an extraneous factor. But you don't know which children are sick in any testing population of kids. You don't know which ones those are. You don't know which children had an emotional upheaval. You know, their dog died that weekend, and they're still pining over the loss of their family pet. They're not really focused on anything. You don't know which one that happened. You don't know which one had an upheaval in their family that night. Maybe their parents are going through a divorce or somebody just got diagnosed with cancer. Now they don't concentrate. You don't know which one had something happen in their neighborhood the night before. Maybe there was a fire up the street or the neighbor got sick and an ambulance came or there was an incident in the neighborhood and the police were there. So of course the little one wasn't in bed. They were looking out the window at the early lights and hearing the sirens. You don't know which ones didn't have breakfast that morning or maybe even dinner the night before. In fact, in any large testing population, about 10% of the children sitting down in the chairs taking that test will have an extraneous factor. Something that makes that score not an accurate measurement of their academic performance. But you don't know which ones they are. And as the socioeconomic level of the children goes down, that extraneous factor interference rate goes up. Because they're more likely to have had family upheaval or something happen in their neighborhood or not have good nutrition. So the children for whom we most need to have accurate results are the children for whom we are least likely to get them. And since there is no way that any Department of Education can know which children they are or make any allowance to control for it, by definition, you cannot say that these tests are valid. Every one of them has an extraneous factor attached to it. That's why, remember the old achievement tests? They gave you an indication of how you did, but they didn't count towards your grade or promotion or graduation. Why? Because everybody has always known that these extraneous factors happen. So we looked at those, and if it didn't, you know, like my sister who was sick, if it didn't match what we see, oh, was he sick that day? Did their dog die? It was an indicator, not considered the true and accurate measurement. Because there's no way to know if it is. So that's validity problem number one. And that validity problem is not only a generic problem, it's a discriminatory problem. Because it's discriminating against children from lower SES back, socioeconomic status backgrounds. You know, we use the word discriminatory a lot when we shouldn't. In this case, we should. These tests discriminate. Second factor, calculator use. 
Pennsylvania's Algebra 1 test says scientific and graphic calculators can be used. Tennessee is allowed to use calculators starting in grade 3. The Park Consortium, their testing, their calculator policy says they can start using a calculator in grade 6. Now maybe you want to know how well a child can use a calculator. But you can't call it math. There's a huge difference between punching numbers into a calculator and hitting enter and actually adding the numbers up yourself. Those aren't the same task. And again, what about the child who doesn't have a calculator? Either because they personally don't have the money to afford a scientific one, or they live in a district that can't afford to provide them. But they're going to get a math result, not a calculator use result. That's an extraneous factor, which means the test is not valid. The new Common Core tests have what are called constructive response assessments. It's a math question. It comes in multiple parts. The child's supposed to solve each part, and then at the end they're supposed to write an essay about why they solved the problem the way they solved the problem. They can be graded, some of them are on a 0 to 4, some of them are on a 0 to 6 point scale. The child can do all the math correctly and not write about it well enough and get a lower score than a child who didn't do all the math correctly. Does that affect certain populations more than others? Yeah, the first population it affects is boys. If you ask a little girl to write an essay, she will. She'll fill the front of the page and the back of the page and she'll put little hearts over the eyes and she may even tell you what she had for breakfast that morning before she took the test. <laughs> because that's how little girls are. They're very verbal creatures. Three of my boys are engineers. If you ask them, why did you do the math the way that you did the math, they would say, because that's the way it worked. <laughs> and what they wouldn't write but would be thinking is, you dummy. Didn't you see the math worked? So boys of one average will get lower scores in this. Who else? ESL children. English is a second language. Who may in fact have learned all the math, but are not yet able to write in standard English. They will get a lower, but this isn't a lower writing score, it's a lower math score. For something that had nothing to do with math. Kids with learning disabilities. We don't exactly know why, but in many cases, LD children do, it surfaces more in the verbal area than in the mathematical area. So these kids can do all the math correctly, but they're not able to actually write about it. They'll get a lower math score, even though they did the math. And again, kids from lower socioeconomic backgrounds who don't have all that standard English at home, so it's harder for them. They're, they tend to be behind, but they're able to do math. So because they didn't write as well, they're going to get a lower math score, and they're going to be put in math remediation. Hmm. Now let's think about that for just a minute. I get asked a lot, well, do we, if you don't like this, do we know what works in education? Yeah, actually, we do. The U.S. Department of Education does actually do studies. One of them was published in a document called Answers in the Toolkit. It was published in 1999. And what the Department of Education found and published was that if a child at the high school level gets beyond Algebra 2, they more than double their odds of succeeding in getting a bachelor's degree. That study became the basis of a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis is where someone looks at all of the research that's been done in an area in a certain time frame. Auburn University published a meta in 2004. They looked at actually 25 years worth of data. That's a huge meta. That was a lot of work to look at 25 years. And they found, they were looking at what leads to success in college, and they found answers in the toolkit. And then they found that if a child gets to calculus, children who complete calculus in high school are 80% more likely to get a bachelor's degree. If a child gets to calculus in high school, they are 28 times, not percent, times more likely to be a high achiever in college. Not just to finish, but to excel. And that number, that result, happens regardless of the child's race or socioeconomic status or the kind of high school that they went to. And it doesn't matter what major they take. 
math beyond Algebra 2, math that gets you to calculus in high school, opens doors, huge doors, to success in college and everything that comes with a college degree. In 2013, Trevor Packer, who is the Senior Vice President of the College Board. Now, you remember our friend David Coleman, who couldn't get hired by the New York City school system and is now driving education in America? He, in 2012, became the new president of the College Board. And he said, well, we're going to change the SAT to be Common Core aligned. And his senior vice president, Trevor Packer, in February of 2013, attended and spoke at the American Association of School Superintendents. And he said, calculus sits outside of the Common Core. Common Core, he said, asks educators to slow the math progression down. A federal think tank called National Center for Education and the Economy, their president, Mark Tucker, has been involved with this all the way back at Goals 2000 that we talked about in the last hour that, be, you know, with President Clinton. Mark Tucker has been involved all that time. In May of 2013, his organization published a document called What Does It Really Mean to Be College and Work Ready? Since that's what we're told the Common, common Core Standards will make our children. And it said, being able to succeed in the first year of a community college is what we mean. And it went on to say, that means math at a middle school level, algebra one by the end of your sophomore year in high school, because, it said, most community colleges begin math at the algebra one level. So why would you have to take algebra two in high school to take algebra one in college? Oh, oh my God. Hmm. So Algebra 1 by the end of your sophomore year puts geometry in your junior year and Algebra 2 in your senior year, which means you won't get beyond Algebra 2. But the Department of Education said if a child gets beyond Algebra 2 in high school, they more than double their odds of getting a college degree. And that children who get to calculus, according to Auburn's Meta, are 28 times more likely to excel in college. Isn't it interesting that the Department of Education in 2014 doesn't know what they did know in 1999? I wonder if they forgot. So Common Core slows math down, and according to the Common Core of progression, the highest you get is to Algebra 2 by the end of high school. Okay. Now let's go back to our test. Remember our test? that the kids are getting lower scores in a math test because they didn't write as well. So what happens to those children? They get put in math remediation. Remediation means you go back and do it again because you didn't pass. So those children will move even more slowly than the common core progression in math. So let's take it as the steps. Step number one. High math achievement in high school is success in college. Common Core slows math down, so our kids won't get to calculus in high school. So we're already lowering their um, ability to succeed in college. These math assessments, which are not valid, give kids lower math scores because of their writing ability. This discriminates against Children with ESL backgrounds, children with learning disabilities, children from lower socioeconomic statuses. They will f be more likely to get a lower math score, therefore not proficient, which means they will be placed in math remediation. Math remediation goes even more slowly than common core. So the children who most need the opportunity to get higher level math, which opens doors of achievement, because remember those doors, regardless of socioeconomic status, kind of high school race, the kids who most need those doors are the least likely to get them under Common Core testing. How can anybody look at that and say that it is, it is anything other than evil? factor validity. It's not the only kind of validity. There are other ways we measure validity. 
The second way we measure validity is we look at our instrument and we say, does it match other instruments out there? Have you ever stood on your bathroom scale? You stand on your bathroom scale and it says you weigh 120 pounds. <laughs> In my dreams. <laughs> okay. And then you go to the doctor and he uses actual weights and it says you weigh 130 pounds. Your bathroom scale doesn't match the doctor's scale. One of them, therefore, is not valid because it's not accurately measured. So one of the way that we, ways that we look at the validity of an assessment instrument is we say, well, how does it match other assessment instruments out there? Does it match up? If we give two tests that are supposed to test the same material to the same people at the same time, do we get the same score? If we don't, something's wrong with one of the instruments. So the states have been writing their own assessments. We give in America, it's called the National Assessment for Educational Progress. It's been around for decades. It's given across the country to a sampling of children. It's given every other year. And the numbers are considered to be pretty accurate. They have a large enough sample. They have validated it over time. They've corrected for problems. So their numbers are considered to be uh, ones that you can trust in the testing scale. In 2008, the National Center for Education Statistics, which is an arm of the USDOE, published actually a chart. And they started by saying, um, here's the achievement range that the national assessment says would be considered proficient in math and reading in grades 4, 8, and in high school. They give it three times. Here's what would be considered basic. Basic means partial mastery. You know, you know some things, but you need more help. And then anything below that means the child's in trouble. So in the chart, when you look at it, there's a brown bar at the top that's called proficient, and a blue bar in the middle that's called basic, and then light blue underneath, meaning these kids are in trouble. And what the National Center for Education Statistics did was they took the place where each state defined proficient and they laid it against the achievement range of the National Assessment of Educational Progress. If the state assessments were valid, all of those proficiency levels should be in the same place that the National Assessment defines proficient. None of them were. Not one single state defined proficient in the same place that the national assessment did. Not one single state matched one single other state. Only eight states defined proficient in the range that the national assessment called basic, and 42 of the 50 states defined proficient below basic on the national assessment. By definition, that makes them invalid. So I went looking. I went into state websites and started digging around for what did they call proficient. My own state is Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has an Algebra 1 test, which under Common Core, the children do not have to pass until the 11th grade. And it is the only math they have to pass to graduate from high school. In 2011, which was the last year for which numbers were publicly available, when you went back into the website, you could see what did the state say was proficient. Because all parents get is a piece of paper that says, congratulations, little Johnny is proficient. In the Algebra 1 test, there were two sections. Each section had three subparts. So there were six subparts. The very first subpart, which was just using numbers, there were nine possible points. If you got three of them, you were proficient. That's a 33%. I don't know any teacher or any planet anywhere on the planet with a child who had a paper that says 33 on it, who would say, congratulations, honey, you're proficient. <laughs> we would use other words. The highest score you had to get was 60. Again, nobody considers 60 to be proficient. I debated the Pennsylvania Secretary of Education uh, some months ago, and I brought that up. And she said, well, that 33% is just one section. Are you insane? There should never be a section where 33% is proficient. Because if you're only getting 33% of Algebra 1, there's no way you're going to do Algebra 2. Maryland, on their state website, it's called the Maryland High School Assessment System, the teachers in Maryland got together and they said they put the level of proficient at the place where all the students could reach it. 
Uh, and the letter grades, it said, were um, meaningless because all of the questions were designed at that level. And my kids read that and said, oh, mom, why didn't you send us to school in Barron? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. In Georgia, the teachers got together to d determine the, uh, how proficient was, and they had a meeting and they gave them the test, and all of the teachers took the test and said, well, here's where we think proficient should be. And then they came together, and this Department of Education said, well, if you set proficient there, this is how many students will pass. Would you like to change where you put proficient? And they did. And they went through the process again and said, so if you put proficient in this new place, this is how many students will pass. Would you like to change where you put proficient? And they did. Hmm. And in Georgia, 80 to 90 percent of the kids are proficient. Huh. What a surprise. <laughs> this is not measuring a student against a standard. It's measuring the standard against the student. And then moving the standard to make it look like the child has succeeded. This is not valid assessment. It's now I know all of us, when you go to have your weight at the doctor, you wish he would do that. Yeah, what your weight is, that's where the standard is. You're good to go. <laughs> I don't know a doctor who does that. I wish, but they don't. Mr. Coleman, when he went to the SAT, said his goal was to make the SAT compliant with the Common Core. And so the new SAT will be given beginning in May of 2015, and it has been changed. It's back to a 1,600-point scale. They've eliminated the essay. They've taken out the penalty for guessing. They've eliminated whole parts of the vocabulary section because they eliminated what Mr. Coleman called obscure vocabulary and replaced it with words you would need in college and career, lowering it. And they took out whole sections of the math test. Because remember, Common Core slows the math progression down, and if the SAT test didn't remove the things that are no longer taught, you might notice. So again, we moved the standard to hide the lack of achievement. That is not valid. Valid tests are supposed to be able to be used to give you information so that you can change your instruction. You can, you can, you know, make it so that you can teach the kids what they didn't know. If you think back to the old achievement tests, you got um, a raw score on that paper, 43 out of 50. You got a national norm. This is how you compared to everybody else in the country. You got a state norm. If your district paid for it, you could get a district norm how your district compared. If they didn't, you didn't. You got uh, a list of, these are the outlines of what the questions are about. And these are the ones that your, your little Johnny got right or wrong. Oh, they got all the multiplication questions wrong. I should teach that. They got all the subtraction questions right. Yippee. They got 45 out of 60, but they got the first 45 right and the last 15 wrong. I need to speed up. This one moves too slowly. So you can analyze it. With Common Core, the tests are secret. You're not allowed to see them. You're not allowed to see them beforehand, and you're not allowed to see them afterward. You don't get the proficiency levels, and they change from year to year. In New York, we talked about the principles that the letter started by 8530 signed it. This was one of the things they talked about. They said, we, we have no idea what these scores mean. They change from year to year. We don't get to see the tests. We don't get an analysis of what the child did right or wrong. We don't know why they got the answers wrong that they got. These scores for us are meaningless. They're not worth the paper they're written on because we can't act on them. We, we can't change education to make them do better next time. So pretty much by every measure that there is, these tests flunk validity. What's the second measure? The second measure is called reliability. Reliability is I get the same result over and over and over again. That's reliability. It sounds like it's the same as validity. And sometimes it is because they work together, but it, sometimes it's not. I stand on my bathroom scale and every single morning it says I weigh 120 pounds. It's reliable. Had the same number all the time. But when I went to the doctor, the number didn't match. It wasn't valid. 
I stand on my bathroom scale, and every morning it says I weigh 120 pounds, but now today it says 130, and the next day it says 150, and the next day it says 290, and most of us go, well, we need to change the batteries. <laughs> because it's now not reliable. Because I probably didn't gain 150 pounds in one day. Even if I had three helpings of spaghetti, probably didn't happen. So it's not reliable. There's ways to measure reliability. The first, it's called test, retest. If I, over time, this child's going to take the test, and if they take the same test again later, will they get the same score? Well, we talked about that, remember, ameliorating factors. Educators have always been told, and actually the, um, it was called Incentives, Incentives and Accountability in uh, Testing. It was published by the National Academies Press, which is a, a federal group. They're funded money from the U.S. Department of Education and some other think tanks, and they do research in education. And they said educators should know and have them that these scores are not actually reliable because they can change because of changes in the test taker that may or may not have anything to do with proficiency. So we should not use them for reliability. But their study went a little farther and they said, you know, when we start giving these assessments in the first year the children will do here, but as time goes on, the score starts going up. Not because the children are learning anymore, but because as the teachers move instruction to teach to the test, they get better at the test. And if we change tests, their score would go back down. Because they're not actually learning the subject matter, they're learning the test. And if we give them a new test, the score will go down, but if we keep the second test, it will go back up. That test is therefore not reliable, because it's not connected to proficiency over time. Nor is it connected to other instruments. The third kind of reliability is human judgment. Did you ever watch the Olympics? Did you ever see the figure skating in the Olympics? You know, seven judges watch the same skater do the same performance at the same time and give that skater seven different scores. And it was such a ruckus, such a, a controversy at the Olympics that they totally changed the Olympic scoring system. So now there's nine judges and they videotape and there's a referee to try to make that score reliable. But you remember our constructive response assessments? So if you look at what the evaluator, they have to evaluate what the child wrote about this math problem. And the uh, directions say, for example, well, minor blemishes in their response are acceptable to get the highest score. Minor blemishes. What does that mean? Well, evaluator A over here is a martinet. You missed one comma. I'll give that to you. But if you missed anything more than one comma, I'm grading you down. Evaluator B over here is a loosey-goosey. Oh, you got the answers right, and you know, it was kind of sort of there, and good enough. You have no way of knowing whether your child's paper was scored by Miss Lucy Goosey or Miss Martinette. You have no way of knowing if your child's paper was scored by the evaluator at the beginning of the day or the end of the day. You know, I read a bunch of essays in my career as a teacher, and I can tell you, you don't score them the same at the beginning of the day as you do at the end of the day. Especially if you're tired and frustrated and have had a glass of wine. <laughs> you're going to score it really definitely. But when it's a teacher in a classroom, I'm your teacher, you know me. You can come back to me and say, um, why did you write this this way? Because you know, I actually, we can have a conversation. And classroom teachers, we don't say they're valid and reliable. But these are determining a child's promotion and graduation. And whether or not a teacher is evaluated and maybe can even keep her job. And yet the scoring itself is neither valid nor reliable because there's no way to correct to know whether your evaluator was the Martinet or the Lucy Goosey at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, and they're not the same. Especially when they're giving guidelines like a minor blemish. That means nothing. The final part of evaluating whether these tests actually meet the standards aren't actually in the definition of valid and reliable, but they're in the general construction of the tests. And in order for a, a test to actually be considered an objective instrument, the evaluator 
should have no connection to the program being evaluated. So for example, the National Institute of Health has guidelines for what are called their data and safety monitoring boards. So we're monitoring a drug regimen or a new device or maybe a, a medical protocol. And what the National Institute of Health publishes says, if you sit on one of these monitoring boards, you can't be involved in the clinical trial that's being evaluated. You can't be part of the test. You can't even be involved in a parallel trial because your knowledge here might affect your judgment in what you're looking at. You can't have any financial connection to the thing that you're evaluating. You can't be an employee of the group that you're evaluating because all of that will change your judgment. It will make it not objective. Most states have nonprofits, and there's laws about nonprofits. Many private foundations require nonprofits to have independent audits before they'll give them money. The federal government in many states, if you get money from the government, they require that nonprofit to have an independent audit. How did you spend the money? 26 states have requirements that if that nonprofit raises a certain amount, they have to have an independent audit before they can do any fundraising in that state. What is an independent audit? An independent audit means you have to hire a certified public accountant who has no financial or any other connection. They can't sit on the board, they can't be part of the staff, they can't have a family member. It's a pure contract arrangement. They must evaluate that nonprofit using what are called accepted standards of accounting in their evaluation and the nonprofit is evaluated on how well they use accepted financial practices. The nonprofit can't say, well, you know, we keep all the money in a drawer for six months and every six months we sort account it. Because they want to make sure that if people are giving money to the nonprofit that they're actually living up to an outside standard. But in education, the Department of Education is setting mandatory standards for our children. They are overseeing the curriculum delivery of those standards. They are writing the assessment that tests those standards. They are setting the passing score for how your children do on those standards. They supervise and in fact sometimes personally administer the tests that measure your children. They score the tests themselves and then they report on their own results. If you were a bank, would you give a business a loan based on that information? Not if you wanted to stay in business as a bank. How insulting is it that our state departments of education expect us to trust the very futures of our children to that kind of invalid, unreliable, and non-objective assessment system? This is beyond insulting. I'm going to stop so you have time for questions because that was a lot of really technical information. Yes, sir. What's the end game here? In the evaluation system? Yeah. To, you know, what they say in this is that we're, we're going to um, decrease the achievement gap. You've probably heard that if you've listened to the thing. So here's where the high achieving children are and here's where the low achieving children are. There's two ways to change an achievement gap. I can bring up the bottom or I can bring down the top. We're making everyone the same. And the colleges are being told that they have to use these state assessments as their new college entrance examinations so that you won't see, it's a seamless package, you won't see that they're failing, which means that an engineering degree will take six years instead of four. So the end game is we're all dumb? The end game is a compliant workforce. When I debated the secretary, there were three on my side and three on, on her side. And one of the people on her panel said to me, Peg, I don't know what you're talking about. They will still take AP Algebra 2. And I, okay, is anybody going to contradict him? Nobody did. Right now, our kids are taking Algebra 2 in 10th grade. If you're taking Algebra 2 in college, it's not an AP course. It's a remedial course. AP is calculus. But we're slowing it down. So now it'll be AP Algebra 2. And since, like in Pennsylvania, the Keystone exams, the only math exam you have to pass to graduate is Algebra 1, you don't have to pass it until 11th grade. 
and Algebra 2 is AP, parents see, my kid's taking AP math. They don't look at those kind of details in all cases. So we've slowed the progression down, which makes everyone the same. You know, Common Core doesn't teach literature, and it, it's kind of sad, because in literature there's a book called 1984. And in 1984, uh, there's a guy named Winston who rebels against Big Brother, and he's eventually caught, and he winds up in prison and re-education. And in the course of that process, his inquisitor, whose name is O'Brien, says to him, don't you get it? The whole purpose of Newspeak is to pull words out. Because if you can't think them, then you can't have a thought crime. So we will keep reducing the number of words and then shrinking the meaning of words. So every year, he said, fewer words, smaller consciousness. He concludes by saying, Winston, don't you know by the year 2025 at the latest, no one will even be able to understand what we're saying here today. If you want a population that does not rebel, you need to slow it down and you need to narrow the focus. But if people can see that achievement is lower, they will complain. So if we lower, if we use the test to lower the bar, people are getting papers saying, little Johnny is proficient. Yay! Nobody looks to say 33? Doesn't happen. Yes? I'm sorry to... And then I'll go to you. Go the, uh, the next question is, these assessments that uh, the previous spoker speaker spoke of said we can opt out of them. We can opt for kids out, I thought. That's in some states you can, in some states you can't. Okay. I don't know what your state law is. In New York, over 40,000 children opted out of the test this year. They, there was a huge impetus. Um, every state is a little bit different. Eventually, if they move forward, they'll try to keep opting out from happening. But the biggest thing right now, that if your children are in the public schools, take them out tomorrow. Because we don't fight a war with children. And this is a war. So, you know, people say, where is this going? And I, I never like to speak to other people's motives. So let me give you a fact. Delaware was one of the two states who got the first round of Race to the Top money. So they are farther ahead in the process than many other states. In Delaware, as part of their uh, program, they now have what are called student success plans. They begin in fifth grade. By ninth grade, they're mandatory. The, all of the data that is collected on the child, as well as interest inventories that the child is given in all of these younger grades, and the data begins to be collected in, in uh, daycare centers now in Delaware, and then through preschool, and we build all this database, and by the time they're in anywhere from fifth to eighth grade, they get what's called a career matchmaker, and that career matchmaker lists up to 10 careers that the child can choose from, and then all of their high school education will be geared toward um, having that career. Parents can look at their student's success plan. They cannot change it. And the list of careers on the career matchmaker comes from the Department of Education. How could it be any more clear? They have no choice, but they cannot change it. Right. They may review it, they may make suggestions, but it, the, the language in the document actually says they cannot change it. I've been in Delaware many times. <laughs> I bet. Helping people fight back. Yes, ma'am. understand enslavement, but I'm thinking, does this mean the powers that be? They think, I mean, where, what I'm trying to get at is, if you aren't having the light of creativity coming out of your, your, your next generation, if the lights are coming up out of the new people, the new human beings, what do they think they have all the information they need? They have all, what do they have all the technology they need that we don't know about? I mean, well, don't they see that this is going to hurt them too? I mean, no, because inside all of the assessments that are being done and all of the data that's being collected, some folks will be selected to be allowed to move forward. Right. right now those include Bill Gates's children and Mr. Obama's children and Mr. Kasich's children, but not yours. But some folks will be selected to be allowed to move forward based on all of this data that's that been collected. Too incestuous. Even I, just the every woman, can tell that doesn't, that's not going to end 
stands upright. That's gonna, you know, when when I inbreed anybody too much, you know, you got hip dysplasia, you got nervous, like yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's but you're nervous. you're applying standards of logic that aren't necessarily being applied to this process. <laughs> Just like folks who are so intent on socialism, even though it never worked anywhere, are convinced that somehow they can work it, make it work tomorrow, we're, we're still seeing that process. And so, and I'm some of the funny... I'm not missing anything because it just sounds so stupid to me. <laughs> yeah, it does, doesn't it? But it, it, it's a different goal, and they're sure that they can make it work. Yes, sir? At a meeting in Columbus last fall, we heard the vice president of the Ohio School Board explain to us that on math, the math for the Ohio graduation test, that for a, or the, the testing for the schools, for a school to become proficient, 70% of their students had to score 32% in math to be determined proficient. And when questioned further why it was so low, he said, well, we have some questions in there for the advanced. So evidently, if you do your numbers, that means that the first 70%, which is your normal proficient rate, 70, 32 is about 70% of 46, so 54% of the people, the questions were for advanced? I don't think so. No, they're not. We have, we have dumped it down so far that 32% is, 70% of our students have to be 32 to be proficient in that school. Right. Which is insane. And beyond said, we have just a couple minutes left, so let me take you, and then one more, and then we'll and close it, or I'll give it to you. <laughs> yes, sir. Can I, I have a question? I have a question related towards this or not? But why don't why don't I'm not a, I don't, I'm not from an education background. I'm just using common sense. Hmm. Why don't we take okay, starting in kindergarten, they go through the kids go through first year of kindergarten. You kind of get an idea of what kids are at what level. Why don't we put the high-level kids in one class, the medium-level kids in another class, and the low-level kids in the other class? That way you can focus. The majority of your kids are at the same level, so you can focus at that level. If you have them all mixed together, you can't focus at the high level with these kids and the medium level. It makes no sense. When you get to high school, that makes sense. At the lower grades, it really doesn't because children develop at all different rates and times. And so you can have a kid that starts in first grade at a low level and by third grade he's at the top. But if he doesn't have the opportunity to, like, once you put them there, they're there, especially at the lower levels. So you blend at the early levels because you, you do get, you know, I, um, one year I taught third grade and I had a little one who was at the very bottom and by December, he was the top in the class. So it, you do get those um, blossomings that happen, and you want that interaction because it isn't at that low a low when they're teeny like that. It's often more a measurement of their development than it is of their intellectual ability, and you want to give kids a chance to move forward. By high school, you want to give kids as many opportunities as possible, so you you open up lots of doors so you can have this kind of a diploma or that kind of diploma but again you want to leave the doors open because children develop at different rates my architect son when he finished his sophomore year in high school that summer his freshman and sophomore year we fought constantly mom sees an average why are you having a problem with this that was that kid and when in the summer between he said i think i'm going to be an architect and i said i think you don't <laughs> because to get into architecture school you need a four and you don't like math and architects actually do do math. And you're not in any of the honors classes and you need to. And he said, I need to do all that. And I said, yes. And he said, okay. And he did. <laughs> and all of a sudden in his junior year, he I was like, what did you do with my son? But never mind, I like you better. <laughs> we all have kids like that. That they, somewhere along the line, they, a light bulb goes off. And the beauty of the American system was that we always, there were always those doors for those kids. But in this system, for example, a Dr. Ben Carson would never happen. Right. Because he would have been slotted from the beginning to the lowest level and never have gotten out. American education, because it was about the child instead of the system, opened doors that no other educational system in the world opened. Well, I'm not saying that... No, I understand. I'm giving you a... Right. I don't want to stay there forever. They move up, right? Yeah, the, 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 and the problem is they're less likely to move up when you sit. The earlier you say, okay, the more likely that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
just in terms of how it works with a child. But when we say simultaneously, we want teachers who can teach, and then we get out of the way and let them, children thrive. But we've allowed folks into the teaching profession who shouldn't ever be there, and then we have shackled the people who knew how to do it and wanted to do it, consequently children are not thriving. So it, it's, a, it's a restructuring that we need, but not the one that they're looking at. And the more education is driven at the local level, the better education is. Okay, time's up. And so I will give it back to you. Don't forget, if you want a CD, they're in the back. Right there, wave your hand. There he is. Um, and I'll be back to you as soon as I can. Thank you so much. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lutz. Look sick. There we go. It's like an O-O sound, but it's uh, spelled with a U. Um, I noticed, it, guys, write, d write this down. Educational Coalition. It's a conference that happens the last weekend in January. Educational Coalition. And we had speakers who talked on, it was all about Common Core this last year, and I'm sure it will be again, but it's all about education. National speakers. What they talked about, one of them talked about was this tracking idea. And he was talking about there being two tracks. The uh, NSA, he was uh, Obama's Secret Service agent. You know that guy, he's been on Fox a few times. I've forgotten his name. Okay, and he, um, he indicated that they're tracking everybody, uh, what you look at on the internet, your YouTube searches, your Yahoo searches, everything you purchase, they're tracking you, and they segregate you into two categories. So he believed, he suggested, that, um, and I think it's on my website, I've got the YouTube on the OSBLC, or not the YouTube, the video on the OSBLC website of this whole conference because I bought the, the uh, flash drive and I'm pretty sure they uploaded it now. But he said that he believes that education will be allocated not by your aptitudes, but by which category you, your family fits into. So if you're more of a Second Amendment kind of person, you're looking at those websites that are already segregated, uh, your child might be that ditch digger category. So he, he wow. didn't have much confidence that this tracking would be based on, and then your designated career choice in the future would be based on that child's aptitudes and interests. It would be somewhere else. And it is a way to keep those rebels of you uh, quiet and keep your kids where they want them. So I don't like any of this tracking. In fact, she said, pull your kids out. Uh, my son, who just woke up last year and took science and math and got great GPA for the first time in his life, I never had to argue with him, doubled up on all these courses that I thought there's no way he would, he would even pass with flying colors. And it wasn't until his sophomore year that he woke up and all of a sudden liked science and math. So I agree, you can't track them in their younger years. You have no idea when that child will wake up and, and this light bulb will go on, and it's a shame if they try to do that to our children. A lot of us wouldn't be where we are today if they tracked us and put us where we should have been, or they thought we should have been in fifth grade. Terrible idea. So, but thank you guys for coming. I learned a tremendous amount today from educators, which is really what I wanted to do, was talk to and listen to educators and find out what their reservations were. I learned a ton, I hope you did. Uh, go to OSBLC, and thank you Roy, K. Rose Videos, for videotaping this, and he's gonna have it for us in a week. <laughs> anyway, we'll have it for you as soon as we can, guys, and you can pass it on, okay? Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.